For over a decade, Ian Fleming's James Bond, arguably the UK's most famous and long-running character, has been played by Daniel Craig. No Time to Die was set to be released this month. In light of the film's delay, I thought I'd take a look back on the actor's interpretation of 007. As the sixth actor to portray the MI6 spy since his debut in 1962, Craig was initially a controversial choice, mostly down to his appearance, a rather baffling argument in retrospect. Thanks to his performance in Layer Cake in 2004, he got the part and went on to gain high recognition for what he brought to the franchise. What kind of journey did he and other producers take the modern productions on? Let's find out. Casino Royale, the film that redefined Bond for a modern age and laid the gimmicks of past entries to rest. In November 2006, I saw it on my 12th birthday with friends and family, and we were blown away by the movie. To this day, it's my favourite entry in the series, and not just from nostalgia. The first of the Daniel Craig set isn't just a brilliant James Bond film, it's a fantastic film period, sitting alongside other productions that transcend their franchises. From the moment the first gun barrel sequence blasted into view and Chris Cornell's You Know My Name started playing, we knew we were in for something special. This new Bond is very different from the previous ones, an assassin who gets in and gets the job done, but not without a clean getaway. The classical Bond was fairly simple, a smooth spy who kissed all the girls and blew the bad guys away, no harm, no foul. Director Martin Campbell, who also directed Goldeneye in 1995, knew the audiences needed a new and improved version, especially after 2002's Die Another Day drifted so far from what made the series work. Going back to the beginning, the cold open establishes Bond as a double O agent, and afterwards wastes no time getting to the meat of the story. It's a clear three act structure, with the first being investigation, the second the titular poker match, and the last being a tragic love story. All the way through, Casino Royale builds itself on one focus, reinvention. When talking about what he brought to the character, Craig said, The question I keep asking myself while playing the role is, am I the good guy, or just a bad guy who works for the good side? Bond's role, after all, is that of an assassin when you come down to it. I have never played a role in which someone's dark side shouldn't be explored. I don't think it should be confusing by the end of the film, but during the film you should be questioning who he is. On the other side of the coin, the terrorist financer, Le Chief, played very well by Mads Mikkelsen, is the main antagonist, and he too breaks convention. He wants money, that much is true, but he requires it to save his own skin, not fuel some outlandish world-ending plot. It's an effective motive for our agent to take on. Bankrupt him in Montenegro, and he'll have nowhere to run. He'll practically be begging to be taken in by MI6. The villains Bond faces here aren't your average goons and anchor the fight scenes with high tension. The parkour chase at the film's opening, starring the founder of Free Running no less, is far more agile, forcing James to improvise. The bomb maker at the airport puts up a hard fought fight in the fuel truck, and the arms dealer on the stairwell attacks the agent with a vicious ferocity. Any other generic action flick would breeze through these moments in a minute or so, but Casino Royale, in its push for heightened realism, shows that the antagonists don't go down easily. Despite its 12A rating, the film is laced with painful, unfiltered action scenes that really get the heart racing. With the grit and visceral nature of the action established, Casino Royale has something that very few Bond films can match, impact. Not just the physical scars left on our hero, but emotional ones as well. Many reviewers have already mentioned the moment 007 cleans himself up and thinks about the brutal fight he's just been through, but the same holds true for other characters as well. Eva Green and Judi Dench are both standouts throughout the film in that they challenge James as well as face adversity themselves. Vesper becomes racked with guilt after helping Bond kill the arms dealer. M is constantly trying to keep Bond in line and clean up after him. Even the Sheaf is constantly under pressure from his disgruntled buyers. By portraying every character as a real person, the 21st Bond film marks its story as one where very few individuals make it through in one piece. The film ultimately was a superb, powerfully engaging entry in the series, with a standout debut from Daniel Craig. We were all excited to see where the series would go next.
Quantum of Solace, the muddled misfire. While Casino Royale got Bond out of the gate in a big way, its follow-up was a major letdown that still stands as the weakest of the Daniel Craig Bond films. A lot of this is down to circumstance. Not only did the screenwriters strike severely cripple Quantum's script, the series was also facing competition from other franchises. In 2007, The Bourne Ultimatum from Paul Greengrass was released, earning rave reviews and high recognition as the concluding chapter of the trilogy. Quantum of Solace is what happens when you feel compelled to follow trends, while also disregarding everything that made the previous film so memorable. Even director Mark Forster admits that he wasn't a fan of the series, yet took the job anyway. Released in 2008, things went sideways quickly. Just look at the opening. Casino Royale started with a bang, Quantum of Solace starts with a terribly edited car chase. The shaky cam style of filmmaking was a curse that fell on many an action film in the late 2000s and early 2010s. Whether it was the degrading quality of the Taken saga, or the many lackluster action flicks that came out in that time period, the filmmaking style spoiled countless productions, and Quantum of Solace fell right into the trap. It marks itself as the first direct sequel in the series, picking up immediately after Casino Royale left off, and establishing an interconnected narrative. This certainly had potential, you'd want to expand and generate a stronger arc for this modern 007, as opposed to telling a new, unrelated story each time. Sadly, the writers appeared to take the easy way out and veered too far into the murderous anti-hero character. Interestingly, Quantum holds the record for the most violent film in the franchise, with an excess of 250 depictions across the film's reduced 106 minute runtime. Casino Royale portrayed the protagonist as a cold-hearted assassin, but it balanced this out with a humanity that lay under Craig's muscular build. None of the characters in this film are half as developed or interesting as its predecessor. While I can appreciate how Olga Kurilenko's Camille Montez isn't penned into the Bond girl role and given her own motives, there's not a whole lot of chemistry or development offered to her character. The greater problem with Quantum of Solace though is that we simply don't have a story here. The flow and structure is hackneyed, and the events of the narrative don't fit together well. From the beginning, we're told by Mr. White that this shadowy organisation has people everywhere, creating an intriguing rabbit hole for James to follow. Instead of following up on what Quantum is and connecting it to the setting, the film instead pivots to Bond going on a killing spree. We get it, he's angry about the death of Vespa, but the film insists on hammering this point down on us over and over again. Despite Craig still bringing his acting flair to the role, it ends up damaging the character overall. There's just not much depth to a protagonist who goes around killing people. Sending Bond out to slaughter some goons over and over creates another problem, drastically diminished tension. Not once do we see 007 stop for a moment to consider his actions personally, and he conducts his violence with a rather uncaring look throughout. It's also trivial to him, and as a result, we don't feel concerned either. The character feels stripped down to a bland action hero archetype, which may have been popular at the time, but refuses to distinguish itself from generic territory, a considerable step backwards in every way. To be frank, he just doesn't have much of a personality in this one. To quote the late great Roger Ebert, James Bond is not an action hero. So many opportunities are a letdown here. Perhaps the film's most visually arresting moment is when Bond eavesdrops on a crowded theatre performance. It builds a strong, atmospheric backdrop, only to crash into a horrendous action scene where you can barely make out what's going on. Quantum of Solace trudges along with only passing mentions of Dominic Green's plans to control Bolivia's water supply. After an overblown escape from an aircraft, the film comes to a halt as James and Camille walk all the way back to town, where James is finally confronted with his actions. Judy Dench is again strong as M, but her efforts to rein in her best agent are sidelined as he quickly fights his way out and hurries towards an anticlimactic final encounter. Taking place in a desert facility, James bounces straight into the action with a snarky quip, and takes on the antagonist while Camille seeks her revenge. Watching it again recently, is there really anything at stake in this finale? Dominic Green with his weak strength and thin characterization doesn't have a chance against Bond here. In fact, he really hasn't done anything to him throughout the film. The fact that he ends up doing himself in with an axe to the foot only emphasises how weak his character is. Ironically enough, it's the showdown with the general that feels grittier, but this doesn't make an impact either because we know so little about this sub-antagonist. 
In short, Quantum of Solace's finale is much like the other sequences, tensionless and noisy, with its ridiculous number of edits severely undercutting the violence. Even in its final moments when Bond leaves Green in the desert with nothing but a can of oil, he hasn't changed in any way, he's still killing with no rhyme or reason, only this time more indirectly. Flimsily capping off the film against a snowy backdrop, Quantum of Solace wants us to believe that Bond has finally moved on from Vesper's death, but there's very little in the plot, action or characters that reinforces this ending. Ultimately, an aggressively disappointing effort that sent the series underground for the next four years. This is the end Hold your breath and count to ten Feel the Skyfall, the grand return and commemoration. After a steady development, the third entry entered production at a major juncture for the franchise. To set the scene, 2012 was a big year for the UK. We held the Olympics in London, commemorated the Queen's Diamond Jubilee, and last but not least, marked the 50th anniversary of James Bond. After the lacklustre performance from Quantum of Solace, expectations were high, but luckily Sam Mendes, director of American Beauty, was on hand to deliver a rousing production. It remains the highest grossing film in the series, and for good reason. The film is incredibly concise and boasts brilliant production values, with the returning partnerships of composer Thomas Newman and cinematographer Roger Deakins, Skyfall is perhaps the most stunning and committed entry on a technical level. The lighting, framing of the action scenes and soundtrack are all fantastic, which brings me to Adele's theme for the film. Widely regarded as one of the best contributions to the series, it's a powerful piece that really highlights the scale of the narrative and foreshadows the confrontations to come. Skyfall continues where Casino Royale left off by stripping Bond down to the bare essentials, while also maintaining a self-awareness of how long the titular agent has been in the life. The opening is another brilliant establishment of the plot and its themes. Not only does the action return to the fast-paced, gritty nature of Craig's debut, but it also emphasises that M will play a more crucial role this time around, as she monitors the operation to obtain a crucial cache of MI6 agent data. The Valda Viaduct in southern Turkey makes for a dangerous backdrop, as Bond is accidentally shot off the edge and falls into the river. By losing the data, the drive for the story is set, and we're in for a wildly entertaining ride. With the underlying theme of cybersecurity established, James eventually recovers, returns to service, and begins his investigations in locations that are dazzlingly presented, especially Macau, which glistens with light as James enters the casinos. Like Casino Royale, Skyfall shows that characters can't just walk away from their injuries. Bond's age, combined with the wound in his shoulder, is consistently referenced throughout the film. It affects his accuracy, causes him to painfully remove the bullet, and prevents him from passing clear for duty tests. Craig does a great job of selling all these scenes, and takes full ownership of the role for the 23rd Bond film. The film also introduces Q, played by Ben Whishaw, who provides much of the comedy. If Casino Royale had impact, then Skyfall has balance. The film deftly switches between establishing locations, action scenes, and dry humour without leaning too far towards one component. It also proceeds at a great pace, with the second act in particular kicking things into high gear. However, while Skyfall comes pretty close to being the best, some aspects of the narrative fall short. One long-standing component of the series is the Bond Girl, and Severine, played by French actress Berenice Marlowe, feels like a throwaway character, someone for the agent to sleep with and lead to silver. It's a tick box that sticks out among a mostly engaging journey. On the whole, Skyfall is a great celebration of Bond as a franchise, with the older gadgets making an appearance and its more self-aware nature. But Silver's grand plan is rather far-fetched and all too reminiscent of the Joker and the Dark Knight. The set piece in London may be high tier, but the context is a bit of a head scratcher. The villain gets captured, counts on a hack breaking him loose, relies on a train crashing at just the right moment to delay Bond, and quickly rallies with his cronies to take M out at the court hearing. 
It doesn't really hold up under scrutiny, despite Javier Bardem's strong performance. As a former agent of MI6, he certainly has the knowledge and skill to pose a threat, and his revenge plot against M is firmly planted in the story. Thankfully, the film's final act, which takes Bond home to Scotland, is a real knockout finish. Removing just about all the tools of the trade, the final fight between James, M, the groundskeeper Kincaid, played by Albert Finney, versus a platoon of Royals forces, is a tense climax that takes 007 back to his childhood home. The extended action sequence brings to mind the set pieces of the best thrillers. Despite being outnumbered, our protagonists must use their wits and ingenuity to outfox the enemy, and it's great to watch. Opening with Bond's car and its machine guns, hit and run attacks with a rifle, traps inside the house, and finally detonating the whole place to take out the helicopter. It's an exhilarating moment all the way through, making good on the promises laid out in the opening. Even as the house burns in the background, Skyfall never lets up as Bond races across the ice to save M. We reach a bittersweet conclusion as Silver is taken out, but the agent's handler passes away from her injuries. An emotive end to her story arc, and a fine way for Judy Dench to bow out of a role she played since 1995. The epilogue is modest in its execution, a reflection on events while setting up the new players for future entries. All told, Skyfall is one of the best entries in the franchise, and as a commemoration, it turned out better than anyone expected. Spectre, the middling middle of the pack. Once the celebration ended, thoughts turned to the next entry in the series. The enormous success of its predecessor compelled the studio to up the budget. At $300 million, it's the most expensive film in the franchise. It seems most of the modern Bond films set some kind of record for filmmaking. Naturally, Sam Mendes, despite not wishing to at first, was brought back to direct the next one, alongside Thomas Newman as composer. It should have been another big success given the director's pedigree. Unfortunately, Spectre is merely okay, a substandard entry that fails to make good on its promises. When I first saw it in 2015, I enjoyed it well enough, but upon a second viewing and compared with other entries, it doesn't hold up as well. The film still looks great, with the lighting and environments in particular again being beautifully presented. This fourth entry was intended to be the last at the time, and looking at the opening credits, it really shows. Showing flashes of previous films and conveying a grand mastermind at the centre of the continuity, Spectre implements the titular organisation and their leader, Ernst Blofeld, reincorporated for the first time since 1971's Diamonds Are Forever. We'll get to him later. Spectre feels like an older style Bond flick trying to squeeze its way into the newer direction the series took while simultaneously unifying previous story threads into a cohesive whole. The results are mixed, to say the least. The opening is strong, another quick action flourish that takes place in Mexico's Day of the Dead festival. Spectre does tread closely to Skyfall when it comes to the first act, Bond's investigations and the gradual reveal of information slowly building intrigue. There's a sublimely shot, if slow, scene in a mansion with some truly outstanding lighting that reveals the villain and his status among the organisation. Rewatching the film recently, however, there's something that sticks out about it. A lack of personality. In Casino Royale and Skyfall, you felt every emotion and action scene because they both had a commitment towards raising the stakes and propelling the story along. Here, things feel more plodding, and that isn't the only issue. The romance that forms between James and Madeline Swan, played by Leah Seydoux, is meant to be a deep and connected relationship, and while the music score portrays it as such, there isn't a whole lot of chemistry between them. This harms the film's final act because we're not wholly invested in their plight. The race to save her is lessened. It's rather baffling as every main actor here is very skilled and experienced. It seems the writing may have hit a snag. 
That brings me to the villain. Having watched Christoph Waltz's excellent performances in Inglorious Bastards and Django Unchained, I went in with high expectations. Sadly, this new version of Blofeld is a rather generic letdown and a waste of the actor's massive talents. He lacks a compelling motive, has flimsy connections to previous films, and at worst, regresses back into cliché territory. The fortress in the middle of the desert, the speech he delivers on the way through, and the device he straps Bond to for torture, all of it harkens back to a tired style that doesn't fit the direction the newer entries have gone in. This isn't the only dated element that makes it in. There's also an oversized thug named Mr. Hinks, played by Dave Bautista, who briefly tumbles with James and Madeline on a train. While these elements don't do the plot many favours, the fight scenes are at least well edited, though the sense of tension has taken another step backwards. The escape from Blofeld's base and the final action scene are lacklustre in this regard. Watch as Bond just breezes his way through all the guards on his way to the helicopter. It feels as if the movie is rushing to the climax, this time taking place in London. This conclusion, too, feels rather tepid and slow. There's not much urgency as James follows directions around the buildings and easily brings down the villain's chopper for a quick capture. It reinforces the fact that Blofeld, for all his build-up, is rather weak as an antagonist. Not the worst of the series, but a mediocre character all around. With no time to die on the way, we're reaching another milestone for the series, the 25th entry, and that brings some fairly high expectations, not to mention it being Daniel Craig's final run as the character. With the director of True Detective at the helm, there's certainly some high potential despite the rewrites and the franchise having transferred to Universal. It's following on directly from Spectre and has several mistakes to make up for. So far, the theme by Billy Eilish is looking promising, and Rami Malik as the villain could be a solid pick based on his outstanding performance in Mr. Robot. My main concern is the film's length. Longer is not always better, and No Time to Die is clocking in at a series record of 2 hours and 43 minutes. Only a small handful of films and directors can justify their productions being that long, such as Martin Scorsese and Peter Jackson in the 2000s. Whichever way the film turns out in November, Daniel Craig's 007 has been a memorable one. Despite the ups and downs of the different films, what he brought to the role was arguably more realistic and detailed than any other actor before him. It will be interesting to see how his final performance fares when No Time to Die arrives. Thanks for watching. I hope you enjoyed going back through the recent Bond series as much as I did. You can follow my blog at the links in the description.